I want to know what's the strangest thing you have in your house. <laughs> Here, hold on a sec. <laughs> so this is this is actually something that my wife desperately felt she needed, and I'm absolutely agree. And it's a box of teeth. This is Box of Teeth, chewing over the stories behind the books, with Michelle Paver and Francis Pryor. Probably a good way to start would be to ask you both to kind of outline the, the new books. I have them both here. Uh, Francis, you'd like to, to kick off and just do a little brief introduction. Oh, look at this, prepared as well. <laughs> right, uh, this is my new book, Scenes from Prehistoric Life, and uh, it's all about well, scenes from prehistoric life <laughs> is another way of saying I'm trying to capture moments in time um, in the past and what it would have actually felt to have been there, to have experienced them. Because we talk a lot about the big events of the past, you know, man invented the wheel. Yeah, but what did he do with the first wheels? And, and what would it have been like when the first wheels turned up in your community? You know, what would they have been supporting chariots you don't know what well, we do know thanks to archaeology so this is a book about how the science of archaeology and, and there is a lot of science in archaeology how that has helped us get inside the heads and the nostrils and the ears of people in prehistory and by prehistory i mean everything before the romans so from a million years ago to a couple of thousand years ago. Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about, well, I guess the Chronicles of Ancient Darkness, but also the uh, new books and what's going on in them? Well, uh, to anyone who's new to the Wolf Brother books, as people often call them, um, they're Stone Age adventures set 6,000 years ago uh, about a boy, a girl and a wolf uh, battling to survive in the Stone Age. Um, Torak, the hero, is um, 12 at the beginning. Um, and he's the best tracker in the forest, and he can also talk to wolves. Wren, she's the best shot with a bow and arrow, and Wolf is a wolf, and parts of the story, of each story, are told um, through his eyes and ears and, crucially, his nose. Um, and Skin Taker is the eighth book in the series, although it is a standalone story, you don't have to, you can plunge straight in. And in Skin Taker, a meteorite hits the forest, devastation. It's in midwinter, um, so it's even more challenging or difficult. Um, demons are lurking in the aftermath. Bears have been woken from hibernation and they are not in a good mood. And the forest itself is dying and it's up to Torak and Wren and Wolf to save it. So as I say, it's an adventure. So obviously both your books kind of have a focus on the prehistoric era. What is it about this kind of um, era of history that you both of you have a fascination about? What is it about it that, that makes you so interested? Well, it started with me when I was about nine, I think, or possibly even before then. My parents had a, a big book of archaeology, which was beautifully illustrated with what I now think are you know, fairly accurate at that time, this was in the 60s, um, pictures. And, but they showed people as individuals. You know, they were not running around with flapping hides and things, you know, badly made. Um, and there was one picture of two children scraping hides um, while other people were going around doing useful, interesting, mesolithic things. And I just thought that looked great fun. And you didn't go to school and it just looked really interesting and dramatic and, that led me to try to be like Stone Age people when I was a kid, get rid of my bed, sleep on the floor, skin a rabbit, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and one thing led to another. I think that's something that you can you can really tell with the books, Michelle, is that you've got that kind of lived experience of having done all of these things, which which you're kind of <laughs> describing through the book, which is absolutely incredible. And it brings it to life so much, which is, yeah, it's just wonderful as a reader. It came, a, the lived experience was sort of much more detailed research later on, you know, visiting the Arctic and swimming with killer whales and that sort of thing and, and talking to people who live in traditional ways, that was the key thing, because uh, obviously, you know, like, like Francis, I mean, you know, I'm not an archaeologist and I studied the archaeological record, but uh, I had to get into how people thought. And, and for that, you know, talking to the Sami or the Inuit or the Chukchi in Siberia, that really helps because they're all different and they've all got insights that I didn't have. 
actually, I had a, a fairly similar uh, discovery of prehistory. Because at school, history was about the royal family. I mean, it's like BBC television now. You know, endlessly the royal family. I hear about another of Henry VIII's wives. I think I'll cut my throat. And, you know, it was never about ordinary people and how ordinary people led their lives. And that's what interested me. And when, by some miracle, I managed to do quite well at A-levels and they accepted me for university, everyone said, oh, you must go to Cambridge and read law. That's what you've got to do, read law. And I thought, no. Mm. God, I can't imagine, it'd be worse than Latin. Mm. And it, I was talking to some people in the pub and they, they, they were coming from an excavation in mm. outside Luton on, on an Iron Age hill fort. And I heard, oh, ooh, that sounds interesting. But can I join them? That's so I asked and they said, yeah, come on, turn up on Monday. So I did. And I never looked back. I'll never forget it, finding my first flints, mm. finding bits of Iron Age pottery digging out the foundations of an Iron Age roundhouse, you know, and, and, and you were dealing with people who were living sort of four or five hundred years before the Romans got here. And I didn't really know these people even existed. Mm. And so when I went to university, I read archaeology, but due to the wisdom of the people at the university, you couldn't just study archaeology on its own. You had to study it with anthropology. Ah, yes. And that yes. meant that I learned about what Michel was saying, how mm. people lived. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after my time at university, I, I'm afraid I spent most of my time organizing Mayballs and rock bands. I was actually offered a job by um, the Beatles agent, Brian Epstein, um, <laughs> <laughs> being a of road course. manager. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, and I then thought, oh, God, uh, you know, uh, my life was beginning to turn upside down. I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll go to Canada. So I went out to Canada and eventually got a job in the big museum in Toronto, the Royal Ontario Museum. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, I got to meet, well, Native Americans. I got to meet people who were researching into, you know, Iroquois sites and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And I, and I had a most fantastic insight into the way people lived their lives. Mm -hmm. I got to meet, well, I actually got to meet Native Americans on their, uh, on, 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 on their reserves. And, and, you know, it was absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, ever since then, I've had this urge to learn more and more about the way people lived their lives mm -hmm. in the remote past. Mm -hmm. And that's what really motivates me more than almost anything else. Mm -hmm. You know, I am quite interested in whether they fought and, you know, all, all these other things. But, you know, it was actually how they lived their lives. What would have gone on in their houses? How did they build their yeah. houses? Mm -hmm. you know, would, would, where would people have sat? Where would they have slept? You know, mm -hmm. How would they prepare their food? I think that's the gorgeous thing about this book as well, Francis, is that it really brings that kind of personal aspect of, of you know, a, a people in a period that we can often feel really distant from in this kind of present age. Um, and it really brings that to life. Is there kind of a daily practice from historic life that, you, that either of you find the most fascinating, something that when you found out about it, you were just like, that is so interesting. I can't believe we didn't know about that. Well, for me, I'll, I'll get ahead of Michelle, but briefly. Please um, do. It, it, <laughs> it, it was when I discovered I was, I was digging away and I came across my first prehistoric fingerprint. Mm. Someone had been making a loom weight, you know, the, the, these are clay, little clay cylinders with holes in the middle that dangle at the bottom of a loom and mm. keep the, the warps, the, the, the stiffer threads tight and then you have to weave between them to make a fabric. And uh, this one was in a house and you could see a, a thumbprint. I'm pretty sure it was a thumbprint. Um, I, I think it was a lady's thumbprint. Um, I often it up again to, to all the thing on the site and it seemed to fit them better than it did. <laughs> the men um, and that was my only way of guessing it but that's one of the things I love about archaeology you have to do that sort of thing you know? mm. and, and you could see it had been cut 
So I don't know what she'd done. Maybe she cut herself on a flint knife or something like that. But and and suddenly, you know, I was thinking, I know what she's thinking as she makes that. I've got to keep that cut really clear. It's not getting wet clay into that cut. Oh, that's going to hurt. You know, and suddenly I was there. I, I could actually, I knew what it felt like to do that, you know, because I had done some pottery and things and uh, uh, quite extraordinary. And ever since then, I've always loved things like pottery and um, salt making materials. Um, they're often out of clay and you use them with their hands like that and you can have where the fingers went round. And, you know, it, gosh, it links you closely to of the past directly mm -hmm. so pottery for me love it yeah gosh well that that's fascinating actually because hands um were the example that came to mind with me i mean there are not lots of things you know and i can't say one was an epiphany but um red ochre handprints in caves we, we've all seen pictures there are loads mm -hmm. of them all over the world many different cultures did but so i can't really remember the first one i saw it was probably in that old book but I do remember on, on some, in some book, seeing a red ochre handprint and red ochre is this stuff in case anyone doesn't know, it's, it's sort of ferric oxide. Here's a bit that I clawed earlier from a cave 200 <laughs> feet down in Gloucestershire <laughs> for skin taker. Um, and you, you can make, you know, it's very messy and I've got wet ones ready to wipe myself off. But, um, it, you know, it dates back tens of thousands of years and many different Stone Age cultures would make handprints. Um, and sometimes they'd make sort of ghostly handprints by spraying a, a hand, um, which is flat against a rock. And then you get the sort of ghostly outline like a stencil and that takes ages to do apparently. Um, and there was one handprint, well, I think there are probably several now, but there was one I saw, which was missing the tip of, I think it's little finger or one of its fingers. So it's incredibly, um, incredibly immediate because that really brings you into contact with that particular person who, rather like Francis's lady who, who had, woman who had, you know, cut herself, there was someone who'd lost part of a finger. And, um, and then I read this book by David Lewis Williams called The Mind in the Cave about, and, and he, the, the key thing I got from that was that, you know, many of these sort of hand prints and things they're not in accessible parts of caves. People went deep into caves through very narrow tunnels as I did for Skin Taker, you know, so narrow you think, how am I going to get out? Quite scary, very scary, um, to do these wonderful paintings and also the handprints. And so there's a sort of spiritual element as there is in, you know, everything I think that hunter-gatherers did. It was, they didn't make a distinction between real life and spiritual life. Um, and so that just kicked off all sorts of ideas and things. And, but I didn't get to use the handprints terribly much in the plot until Skin Taker. So then, you know, I'm getting stuff in when you're a novelist is a besetting sin, shouldn't do it. Um, so you know, there's loads of stuff I've had to leave out, but I'm very pleased that in Skin Taker, there is now an episode deep down in a cave where you've got a handprint with a little bit of a finger missing. And it comes into the plot. Um, so yeah, I think that really, as with Francis, you know, you're connecting with an individual. I mean, I wasn't there, you know, um, in quite the same way as, as Francis luckily was, but uh, still, you know, imaginatively you connect with an individual. It's an amazing feeling. And I suppose both of you have obviously done, so, you know, so much research for, for the works and your, your careers in general. Um, so something that I, I did ask and I sent a little email earlier uh, about is what is the one thing from your, your research kit uh, that you can't kind of live without, that you couldn't get by without? And I don't know if, if either of you have something to hand. I know, Francis, you sent me a little line to say that you'd got, got, got something ready. <laughs> yeah, here it is. This oh, is the, the I thought you armor. might. <laughs> this is a trowel. And one of the things you notice, this is one of my, I've got a, loads of trowels, I've got about 10 of them. But if you, one of the things, I'll see if I can hold it up in such a way that it's obvious on the screen. It's not even. So that side oh. has been worn down more than that side. And that's because you use an archaeological trowel to scrape like that. And so that means a right-handed person has used that trowel to scrape away. And wow. 
yeah. yeah. So you can always, I always used to check when students arrived, did you get well, I asked to have a look at their trowel and they'd say, oh, so, oh, so I'm very experienced. I've done a lot of work. I said, can I have a quick look at your trowel incidentally, make sure it's the right sort, it's a WHS. And they'd hand them over and I'd see they were even. Oh. And then nearly always it was lady students, girl students, would turn up and say, uh, I'd say, you know, have you got any experience? And they'd say, uh, oh, no, not, not, not really. And I'd say, can I look at your trowel? And it would be like that, off centre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know Gosh. why I do this, but it's a, a golden rule. So future archaeologists will be able to tell whether the person, the user was right-handed or left-handed if they Absolutely. dig up your trowel. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's one a piece wow. of modern history. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And do you do you kind of stay with your trowel? Is it one of those things that you, as a as an individual, as an archaeologist, you kind of keep with you? Is you have a personal one that you have a real connection to? Oh, good heavens, yes, yes. Every <laughs> archaeologist has got his or her trowel, or in my case, trowels, because yeah. we use uh, slightly larger blades if we're working on a sandy site and mm -hmm. and so on. Oh yeah, and they live in the back pocket of your jeans with the point mm -hmm. up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very important. <laughs> yep. Yep. Wow. Fantastic. And and Michelle, have you got have you got something? Really boring compared to that. So I'll be quick. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's not even that essential. It's just a notebook and a pen. Mm. Um, yep. Because really, the key thing is just the brain. I mean, there's a wonderful. I think it's Inuit or Sami, which says the most important possession a man has or a woman has is what she, the knowledge she carries in her brain. Um, and that's that's the hunter gatherer ways. You just, you know, you observe things and you learn by watching someone else making um, arrowheads or knives or whatever. Um, and, you know, when I'm <laughs> in the field, as it were, I've often just not been able to use my notebook. And so I just try to remember key words of thoughts and ideas that come to me. I suppose um, off the back of that, I'd be really interested to know uh, what's your kind of favorite place to do research, which, you know, kind of favorite uh, place that you've done field research, Michelle? For me, it's always the Arctic. Um, I, I love snow and ice. Um, so so the, the ice cave for the, the previous book, which was Viper's Daughter, um, under the glacier, Mendenhall Glacier in, in Canada was fantastic. Um, actually, that was Alaska, sorry. So I love ice, um, the Greenland ice sheet. They give me ideas, you see, ice is always different. Um, the edge of the Greenland ice sheet was black, the bit I went to, uh, because of all the, the, the moraine, you know, the, the ground up stone gotcha. that was in, and that gave me the climax of Soul Eater, the, the third book, you know, I suddenly saw black ice, white bears, red blood, all very exciting. Um, so I love the Arctic and, and the people there are always so different. You know, I think Francis in his, his book, which I thoroughly enjoyed, by the way, um, he talks about how prehistoric people were not homogeneous, you know, and that's the besetting sin, I think, of reconstructions in, in some, some TV documentaries. Um, they all look the same and they're all wearing imperfectly made skin clothes and things, but every hunter-gatherer culture or tr more traditional culture I've visited in the present has been so different from all the others. You know, the Chukchi in outer Siberia have a completely different approach to life, um, a different belief system from the Inuit and from the Kwakwiutl in um, Canada. And that's one of the things I really love. Um, and it gives me so many ideas you know, um, ideas for how they think and feel and how they just do things, mm. um, you know, everyday things like, you know, do you hang up a lot of smoked fish in your your actual shelter where you sleep? Um, mentioned in, in Francis's book. Well, I personally don't think they would. They tended to have, they tend now they, they to have smoke huts, separate ones for the very good reason that the, the fish, when it's smoking, drips rather smelly oil all over you. Um, you know, things like that. It's great. And it gives me ideas. So yes, the Arctic every time. Uh, and, and yourself, Francis, I can see, I know which book you've just reached for. And it's, it's one that I'm very fond of as someone who, who grew up very near the fence as well. So I feel oh, like I might, yes. I might have an idea of your answer. Um, but your, your favourite place, Francis, that you've done your, your research? Well, my favourite place is the fence. Yes. <laughs> Uh, where I'm talking from. 
sit, I'm sitting at about two meters above sea level. Wow. Very, very aware that at high tide the water is probably about here. <laughs> um, and also, one of the things that came out of the writing of this book, well, I mean, I, I knew it anyway, but this really brought it home to me, is the problem of, of climate change and mm. global warming. Um, and I, I, I have to say, I do get just a little bit irritated when, you know, the, 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 the younger folk today sort of imply that we haven't known about this for a while, <laughs> you know. Um, I've been acutely aware of it, certainly since the 70s. Mm. Um, ever since I started looking into how Britain became an island and you know, how the North Sea rose, you know, Britain only became an island about 6,000 BC. Mm. Um, and um, so most of the prehistory I discussed in my scenes book took place when we were still a part of Europe. You know, we couldn't have done a Brexit. That was, we were joined on. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's just how recent some of the changes have been yeah. and how fast. Yes. You know, the climate was different in the Bronze Age and in the Iron Age. You know, I mean, not profoundly different, but significantly different. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the graph of um, climate change, temperature change, after 1850, when we started burning coal. And you know, I am seriously worried mm. about the future of many low-lying parts of Eastern England, because at some point, and I think well, it probably won't be in my lifetime, but it'll be in uh, my daughter's lifetime, certainly, um, I think that the politicians are going to have to decide what do we flood the Fens and lower lying parts of Norfolk and Suffolk or London. Well, it comes to it, you've got 10 million voters in London, mm. you? so it's a mm. no brainer, even to non populist politicians who might have brains. Mm. You, know, you mm. flood the low lying areas, and then that, that will buy a little time for London mm. because of you know, the, bar the, the, the Greenwich barriers only got a finite use life and okay you replace it but water can always go around the edge so yes i um learned a lot about the present by studying the past and that's another thing where i'm sure michelle would agree with me the past gives you a totally different uh perspective on the present and you get that perspective not by studying the political changes so much but are studying the way the world worked, how roads developed, why railways came, how the canals developed and so on. So I, I have a, a terrific interest in recent archeology span as well. And that came in very useful with the Fens book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sobering Sorry. stuff, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no. And I think it is, I can imagine, especially living, living where you do, it is something that's really at the forefront of Mm. of your your brain a lot of the time especially like you say when you've got that knowledge of just how a constant that kind of climatic shift is mm. and and how you know it's it, you know, we've had rising sea levels like you say which as you do in in scenes from prehistoric life that's you know just being a, a constant feature which is so affecting to certain areas of the country it must be yeah it comes up every time i go to the arctic as well francis i mean yeah. you know in, in the 30 years since i've been going um it's just changed so much, you know, and the people just, you know, it's, it's going so terrifyingly quickly. The glaciers are receding. And I should add that I don't go as often because mm. obviously I'm trying to cut down the number of flights. Well, mm. I haven't been anywhere. I haven't been out of Wimbledon for the last two years, but, you know, even before then, you know, it was sort of cutting down the flights and things. Um, but yeah, um, you know, and all these poor huskies. Last time I was in Greenland, these poor huskies were sitting around and it was spring and they should have been, you know, there should have been lots of nice ice around and there wasn't. But, but just on that, I mean, you know, Francis was talking about the archaeological record telling you how, you know, changes can happen. And, um, and sometimes they can be really sudden. I mean, I was going to set the whole of the Wolf Brother books 7,000 years ago. Um, but then I read somewhere about something called the Storiga Fault, um, mm. when there was a, a fault out to sea. Um, and a, they think probably a, a large tsunami 
which sort of swamped part of Western Europe, particularly. And I was thinking, you know, my books are set in Northern Scandinavia. I thought, oh, they're all going to be underwater. Uh, so that's why it's set 6,000 years ago, not seven. But they have the great wave in their, the clan's memory, um, yeah. and, you know, uh, handed down as, you know, something pretty awful. Um, yeah. So few. Glad I did that bit of research. Otherwise, Francis would be saying, "Yeah, what about? Why is it set six, seven, seven thousand years ago? Wouldn't they be all all be underwater?" <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to ask um, Michelle because obviously your books are so set in like a particular period and so mm. grounded in history in that way. But something you said earlier was, which I thought was really interesting, which was you were talking about how back in those times they didn't really make a distinction between real life and spiritual life, how much spirituality mm. and their kind of belief system was such a part of their daily life. And you can see it in the Wolf Brother books, how mm. magic almost is, I want for a better word, is mm. such a part of uh, the world and has real consequences. How, what was that like uh, for you to write that? How did you balance that or come, come about that? Was that always there from the beginning or, you know, did that come later? What was that like? Well, that, I mean, the first thing to say is we don't know, um, you know, uh, I, 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 there's so much we don't know about the Stone Age. Um, so I'm having to imagine, I mean, the red ochre helped a lot because I think many people do believe that there's something something had a spiritual use it wasn't just sort of to keep the sun off and the insects out although it does does have that usage um i don't think it was any one particular thing it was just doing a bit of research to begin with into i, I very quickly thought well, it's not just about arrowheads and and you know what what we do know which is a lot about the stone age it, it's um how do how does a hunter gatherer think and so i had to look at you know the inuit particularly the inuit um, in that very early research and then mm. it quickly threw out very differences with us you know a lot of them move around so they don't value possessions much you know because it just weighs you down you want something light you don't carry pottery if you're a nom nomadic hunter-gatherer you make something out of birch bark but you make it really beautifully you know this is made by the Dene people in Canada and it's it's sewn with spruce root you know um, how great is that? And it wouldn't take them very long to make. Make string out of nettles. Here's one I prepared earlier. Um, Doing excellently with the show and tell. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> Aboriginal um, knot bag made out of band pandanus leaf. Oh, and apparently there are rock carvings which show this kind of knotting was used sort of 40,000 years ago. Um, but the spiritual element came very quickly, you know, because this is just a tiny little knife. Another show and tell. Sorry, we'll stop. Um, <laughs> no, don't, don't stop. Don't stop. More, <laughs> more spruce fruit round a little piece of reindeer antler. But oh. you probably can't see, but there's a little sun motif um, sort of carved in. And this is a Sami piece of carving and the sun is important to them. Um, and there's something else which would have a perhaps a, a forest mark on it. Uh, because the forest god was very important. So, you know, it's just as soon as I started looking at more recent traditional peoples, that the, the sacred is, is part of things, you know, earth blood has its uses, but it's also sacred because it's the earth blood. And it really feels like that when you're under in a cave and you're clawing away at the veins in the earth. Um, so so that, that came up very quickly. But as I say, you know, that's, it's great for a novelist, um, but I, I guess, Francis, you can only go so far with that sort of speculation when you're an archaeologist, because at some point you come up against sort of evidence and stuff like that. Although you have a lovely bit in your book about, is it Tom Naveri that, that, that in, in yeah. Scotland, where, where you're, you're speculating about a midnight mass for the moon, you know, which is, I thought, fantastic, because I bet hunter-gatherers love the moon because it doesn't desert them in the winter, you know. Yes. I think one of the things that comes across, which um, I absolutely agree with you, is that religion, for want of a better word, the spiritual world is mm. probably better than religion, um, and the ordinary daily world were completely one and the same thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, we in, in modern world, we relegate religion, if we're Christians, to Sunday. 
and if we're Muslims for Friday, you know, th th that's that's what happens with religion. It's it's a, a, a different part of our lives. So we put on a slightly smart clothes and we walk around looking reverential. That's being religious. Whereas in prehistory, religion imbued everything you did. Yes. You did have special ceremonies. You went to places like Stonehenge or whatever, um, but it it was all encompassing. It, it it was religion that held the family together, and it was the family, the structure of the family, that held religion together as well. Um, and there are some direct parallels with the modern world. I mean, um, you mentioned the Sami with that lovely knife um, that you showed us at last. Um, the site we dug in the late 90s called, uh, nicknamed by the, by the press Seahenge on the North Norfolk coast was a circle of 55 oak timbers um, with an upside down oak tree in the middle. And the Sami have similar sites because like the people in Seahenge, uh, which was built between April and June in the year 2049 BC, so we can be quite precise in archaeology, um, uh, they believed that the, there were spirits below the surface, below the ground. I mean, as Christians, we always think, well, as a one-time Christian, I imagine that, you know, it's all up there in heaven, but to the Sami, it was below. And you get fascinating insights when you work somewhere like the Fens, as I've done in my life, where you realize that they regarded water as special. Yeah. It's essential to life. You've got to drink the stuff. You've got to cook with it. You know, water is essential, practically. But you see your reflection in water. You know. And in the modern world, we're, we're all used to our, our own faces. You know, you, you have mirrors, but nowadays, increasingly, you've got these damn things. Um, and, and you've got screens, you know what you look like. Oh, God, that pimple's getting a bit bigger. Oh, I'll check it again in 10 minutes. You, know. um, you didn't do that in the past. You barely knew what your face looked like. Because how often do you come across still water? Mm -hmm. Think about it. I mean, you know, you don't especially if you're living out in the open most of the time. And on the other hand, you know, so water is a reflection of the present and it's a reflection of you, but you pass below it and you're dead, you drown. So, you know, when you offer swords and daggers and spears to the water, as they did all over Northern Europe, um, you're actually placing the swords and daggers and things in the realm of the ancestors. And that's why they never get pinched. Because in ancient Egypt, the pharaohs who had a different religion from uh, the rest of society weren't mm -hmm. immune. So Tutankhamun, they went to all this trouble building false, false corridors and this and that to try to stop the bastard thieves getting into their tomb in the, temp in the, in the pyramid. Well, in the Bronze Age, people all shared the same religion. So you place an incredibly valuable sword, I mean, it would be an equivalent of a Range Rover, in modern money, place it in the water, it probably glints away for a bit, but people walk by and they say, mm, that's in the realm of the ancestors, I'm not touching it. So you do get fascinating insights into how belief controlled behavior. Mm. You know, because there are thousands of pounds worth of Bronze Age, I mean, worth in bronze in the Bronze Age of Bronze Age metalwork in Britain's bogs and rivers still. And gloriously, I suppose it's in the right kind of uh, setting for them to survive so well as well. So we can absolutely rather wonderfully yeah, have a little peek into that yeah, that yeah. bit of life, which is glorious. <laughs> And uh, I suppose that needs, leads me on quite nicely to uh, one of the one of the other things we would like to ask you to do, which is ask for an object that you have in your possession, which is uh, particularly bonkers, one of the kind of strangest things you own. Um, I know, um, I mean, Michelle, you've got a kind of glorious array of objects <laughs> in within arm's reach. <laughs> but, uh, 
<laughs> I don't know if you've got something particularly strange or unusual or I, I, I had to think about this, so thank you for giving me warning, uh, not least because otherwise I'd have to sort of rush off and get it. Um, what I've come up with is something that I had, I, have a, I had a rather strange, mad aunt who lived, um, my father was South African, she lived in, uh, um, she was married to a game ranger and she lived out in the bush in South Africa and um, she was friends with the Sangoma, a witch doctor, and when I was nine she sent me this which, um, well, sort of a doll. It's made of bark. I mean, this is something I find quite fascinating. It's made of, of woven bark, which is why I put woven bark in, in the stories. Mm. And it's the bald head, which I found particularly <laughs> frightening. And it was made by the Sangoma. And she sent it to me along with a medicine horn, which gave me the idea for Torex medicine horn. And she said, dear Michelle, um, don't sniff the horn. It used to hold powdered snake. Um, so of course I sniffed the horn. Um, but this thing, I don't, she never said anything about it except it was made of tree bark. And I just thought, does she expect me to play with this? I mean, I didn't play with dolls anyway. Um, but so this is, I've always kept it because I think it's a bit scary, but kept it in a, in, in a, a dark cupboard so it can't exert any force or anything. But yeah, I mean, it's fairly strange. But um, it's bonkers. I love it. <laughs> it is quite bonkers, and it's those sort of strange eyes and that face. And has it ever done any curses? I don't know. There we are. <laughs> you've never, you've never decided to turn it on someone that you've found particularly unsavoury. <laughs> it's quite an idea, but uh, no. <laughs> uh, and yourself, Francis. Uh, I, right. Again, I've heard that you've got something. Yeah, similar. I do. I'll produce it. Here it Ooh. is. Oh, look at that. <laughs> wow. What is, is it fully working? Yeah. Oh, gorgeous. I'll angle this down. There you go. <laughs> so you can see what is it. it? It's a beam engine. It's a, so this, this is the cylinder that pumps compressed steam and it raises the beam like that. And then the the wheel, uh, it goes round and round, and that is what works a pump. And it was beam engines like this, which drained the fens in the 19th century. And you can still see them in some of the preserved pumping stations, but I mean, uh, they were a lot bigger than this. A, a man could stand there. Right. Gives you some idea of the scale of it. They were wow. massive. And this 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 is a strange one because it did it I've seen it work. You have to get a, a, a torch like thing, um, a, a lamp type thing and, and hold it under it. Um, but essentially um, uh, I think this was made sometime before the First World War, maybe in the late 19th century. And um, uh, it, it got left in an attic at home in my, in, in my parents' house. And then when my parents died, we were, you know, all, a lot of stuff went off to auction, whatever. And I remember going through the attic and I came across this in a corner. And I thought, oh no. And then um, a few years later, as I, I set up home here in, in the mid nineties, and uh, I was going around looking at Fenland pumping stations and then I came across this one, I think it was at Surrey, and I thought, oh my God, yeah, Fenland pumping engine. Incidentally, there is a, a true story here. The, the biggest inland, the biggest lake in Britain, or the second biggest, was uh, Lake Whittlesey, Whittlesey Mere, just south mm -hmm. of Peterborough, which mm -hmm. was drained in the 1850s. And one of these pumping engines probably wouldn't have coped because they used the very first centrifugal pumps for draining Whittlesey Mere. And that is one of the areas which we're going to have to reflood quite soon. Mm. Um, it's, it's, you know, the land level has dropped 15, 16 feet in, a, in sort of 250 years. And it's catastrophic. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, these engines have caused a lot of damage. Mm. Mm. So oh. 
You know, we're is. proud of inventing them, quite rightly. You know, I like inventing things, but think of what they do. I I have to I have to admit I think if I were to um if I were to have brought something myself if I were to bring a kind of strange object it's back at my kind of family home but I do have a small shard of wood from Flag Fen which oh. I got when I was perhaps I must have been maybe nine or ten years old and I went on a school trip and it's in a little wooden box and I remember I, I'm the same as you Michelle it was one of those things I would smell it just to because mm. it, it had this incredible smell to it that really kind of it was kind of smoky and oh, it was beautiful. And it sits on my bookshelf at home. Wow. And I've, you know, it's one of those things that I really, really treasure. And it's completely bonkers because it's, yeah, kind of, you know, more than 3,000 years old, I suppose. But it's just it's amazing. magnificent. And yeah, I love it. So <laughs> it's very exciting for me to be able to talk to the, the man who found the sites. It's, yes. yeah, incredible. <laughs> I think we've okay. probably we've we've <laughs> chatted <laughs> we've had show and tells it's been absolutely glorious this has been so wonderful I think both Gemma and I are just yeah uh, enormous fans of, of both of you so it's lovely to mm -hmm. lovely to have the opportunity to kind of wax lyrical sorry I feel like we've both just gone oh this is really nice. <laughs> um, but it's been such a joy and yeah thank you so much and and yeah please kind of keep on doing doing what you're both doing because it's lovely excellent well I think we'll leave you to it but Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Run, 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 kind, 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 k